listening to the PR Wind Down Podcast, the show for public relations professionals who are ready to see real change in the PR industry. We are your hosts, April White and Laura Schooler. Let's get ready to wind down. Okay, Laura Schooler. Yeah. Well, welcome to the PR Wind Down. <laughs> Why, thanks. What's new in your world? What's going on? I saw Depeche Mode recently. That was not the concert that you watched secretly from the park. No, I just went to Depeche Mode. I guess not this weekend, but the weekend before. Okay. And I hadn't seen them in person since 1988 when I was three. (laughs) Right, exactly, exactly. (laughs) And I still have the shirt from the 1988 show. And I wore it on the beach, just sort of like over my bathing suit and people freak out. They'll be like, oh my God, is that real? I'm like, yes, it is. I've had it ever since then. So anyway, I wasn't planning on going, but a friend of mine keeps buying tickets to 80s bands shows. Yeah. I know them. I am into them, but I'm not willing to spend the money that concerts cost at big, you know, venues. So he buys these tickets and then... For whatever reason, he's always got one or something that he can't get rid of or sell or whatever. So then he comes to me and he tries to con me into buying it. And he's like, no, I got a really good price. I got a really good price. Like, you know, two tickets for uh, 130. I'm like, that's not a good price. (laughs) Now, what's the price per? 130. That's like a normal concert price, unfortunately. Right, but not in my world, it's not. Right. So so now he's like, I'll give you the, I won't say his name. I'll give you er, price and so he only makes me pay him $60 oh my god that's so sweet so how so he, how he like the loses concert... like you know $95 a ticket but otherwise he would have a so funny. nobody and b he wouldn't get to go with me which is you know the big prize <laughs> <laughs> how did the concert compare to when you were a kid I don't god I don't remember in 1988 but you know some of their greatest music hadn't been made yet so I had never seen them do, I don't know, Violator, whatever the next couple of albums were that I liked yeah, a lot yeah. of the songs. But they played a lot of stuff that either was very new or was like after 93, so I didn't know it. So it was a couple of songs I knew in the beginning <laughs> and then a desert and then a lot, you know, a bunch of songs I knew at the end. Sounds so horror. fun. I hope I have a similar story. I'm going to the Hozier concert in Vegas. On I don't Friday. know who that is. <laughs> that does not surprise me. It's a modern artist. A contemporary artist. No, he's amazing. I've never seen him in concert. I'm so excited. Okay, so our new story of the day is about super commuting being on the rise. And this is a story in Insider where they gave the initial example of this guy who is a VP at a tech company in San Francisco, but lives in Des Moines, Iowa. And once or twice a month basically has to fly from Des Moines to San Francisco to show up to be in person for the job, but is, is, you know, continuing to live in Des Moines rather than move to San Francisco. And so basically what's happened is with these hybrid jobs, some people are choosing to stay where they were. Well, the cost of living in San Francisco versus I'm sure, I mean, sure he's on the math, right. Versus flying to San Francisco twice a month from Des Moines is probably still advantageous to live in Des Moines, right? Rather than like live in San Francisco if that's not where you want to be. Um, And so basically when the sudden rise of all these fully remote jobs allowed everybody to relocate to small towns far away from the big city employers, now there's this new issue that's arising when they're supposed to be in person a certain number of days a month or week. But it sounds like a lot of these super commuters are averaging at least three hours traveling to and from the office each day, and they're sort of reshaping the geography of American work. So it says the winners will be the big cities that best accommodates the needs of jet sitters when they're at the office and the quieter locales that cater to their lifestyles when they're at home. The losers are going to be the mid-tier cities like Cleveland Uh, and Syracuse that have long served as regional hubs for large employers. So basically the ones that are sort of outside the outskirts of the big cities where people tend mm -hmm. to live are, are the one, you know, you don't have to be there anymore. Okay, Mm -hmm. cool. I just have to be in New York twice 
a month or whatever. I don't have to, I don't have to live in Syracuse. I can live in the middle of nowhere. It could Arizona. Be near the Grand Canyon, the Grand Canyon, right? <laughs> yeah, and, you could be anywhere. Well, so, you know, there were certain jobs, salesperson jobs, you know, big executive jobs were mostly men, like we're talking about decades ago, were going all over the place all the time. So they were super commuters, you know, getting a million miles. What's that movie with George Clooney? Where he's, you know, got he's the 10 million miles or whatever. And um, so I don't know that this is a new phenomenon in terms of like people traveling a lot for business, but I think who's traveling for business and from where and why it's probably well changed. the home base is different right yeah because yeah. I think traveling a lot for businesses is, is been a thing for some time but living not in, in the city nowhere, yeah right. in some small weird place that or Maine or whatever yeah yeah or just living somewhere completely unexpected yeah is definitely a post-pandemic thing there was also a story going around a few several months ago about a young woman who like lived in North or South Carolina and would commute to New York because it was cheaper to fly to New York every week than it was to live in New York. I mean, of course that's true. New York is the most expensive city in the world. And the insider story says, among those who worked from home during the pandemic, 46% now have a hybrid schedule compared with 34% who are fully on site and 20% who are still fully remote. That means employees who've moved their families to cheaper towns during the pandemic or who accepted jobs at companies that are nowhere near their homes now have the option to stay put. But more hybrid jobs means more super commuters. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. I mean, you used to have to move for your job, right? I Now, I would never do this because the strain and the stress and the exhaustion of traveling that much, I couldn't take it. It would not be worth it to me. It's worth it to some people. They want to live in the middle of, you know, whatever, like you said, to go snowshoeing in South mm -hmm. Dakota, but their job is in <laughs> Dallas or whatever. I It would not be worth it to me. I couldn't even commute on the bus, you know, from New Jersey to New York, I would have gone out of my mind. Like I have to be where I'm working. But they also said, this started to happen with a co married couple, man and woman, whatever, married, you know, adults. Maybe they're the same sex. Maybe they, whatever. That they both had high level important jobs in different places. And so one wasn't better than the other. And so, you know, we, we have to move because of my job. Well, what about my job? You know, so mm -hmm. now they do both. They have a home base and they both travel to wherever their jobs are. This stuff never would have happened in the 80s, 90s, whatever, ever. No way. You made the decision and you left. You went somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. They use another example in here of a woman who had to be in the office two or three days a week, every other week. And she was living in North Carolina and still found that living there was much cheaper than living in New York, even with paying for all the costs of flights, Ubers and subway fares herself. And then who paid the, where did she stay? Does it say like a hotel in New York for three days is certainly not a cheap, maybe you know, her job paid the, for it. Maybe, I don't know. I mean, with the rent in New York, it still might be cheaper to get a hotel or well, right, Airbnb. Right. So, I mean, if we're talking about market rate rents, if you just come in right now and go to a real estate yeah, we're not, and say, yeah, hey, we're not give me an apartment. Yeah. We're not talking about you who's been there forever. It's, right. No, I can't leave and come back. Mm -mm, like, I'm here cents. forever now. You're stuck. Yeah. 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 No, you can't come in. If you came now and be just to get some basic nothing, you'd be paying five grand a month. Like, yeah. I guess, minimally. So what are the PR implications of this? I almost think it's more of an internal communications issue. The external PR implications are stories like this, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think we have to see how this all shakes out. I think all of these things are so new and different. Who knows how it's going to affect families, education, you know, the future of work, jobs. Are some of these companies going to be like, forget it, you have to live in this city or you, you're done? They might, you know? I think we're still in this mode of who knows what the hell is going to happen. But if they start and firing people that are not nearby, actually, yeah, actually right. local, then right. that could also have crisis. Or will some of these people, like I said, operation. start getting sick of doing this monstrous commute every other week? I mean, it depends, right to your point, what if they have their kids on the best school system in Des Moines and you know the schools 
they're way better than the ones in wherever they could afford in San Francisco. <laughs> like, right. I mean, you know, there are all these variables that people are factoring into their life choices now. So yeah, that's, life's getting that's a tough uh, one, really complicated, easier and harder all at the same mm-hmm. time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's pretty interesting. I wonder if any PR firms have super commuters for their hybrid jobs now. What I run into is that most PR firms are either pretty flexible with at least hybrid or they don't really care where people are. That's what I've run into in the past few years. I mean, yeah. you're, you obviously, but you were like that even before the pandemic. But I think PR firms, if they find somebody they really like, they take them because it's not easy to find good PR agency people. So yeah. whatever, we'll take them or her or them. Yeah. And I don't, we don't care where they live. I mean, a, a woman um, that I've been working with now for my consulting job, which has now been over a year, she just moved to Maine. There's no office in Maine. Sounds amazing. So, right. It's like beautiful, you know, nature. But I don't even remember where she was. She was like in Long Island or something. I never met, saw her in person anyway. You know, she wasn't going to the office in New York hardly ever right. anyway. So what difference does it make? And her manager's in Chicago. So what difference does it make? Yeah. So what difference does it make? Oh, so that was my Morrissey moment. moment. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay. Well, anything else to add on that or should we wrap it up? No, but I love all of these stories, these new perspectives on working and having a job and getting a job and keeping I, I it's just very interesting to me surprised you didn't go into HR I should be a the renegade HR a consult no I should be a like you know a, HR a, consultant a high level executive recruiting consultant there you go okay well on that note should I let our guest in yes So our guest today is Jenna Guaneri. She is the founder and CEO of JMG PR, and she's here today to discuss her book, You Need PR, an approachable guide to public relations for early stage companies. So welcome, Jenna. We're very excited to have you and hear about this book. Thank you both for having me. I'm excited. And what a day. It's National Publicist Day, too. I know. I know. It's amazing. Right? It's our yeah. holiday. It's, I, <laughs> I didn't we even only know that. One. I saw people had posted it on LinkedIn, and I was like, oh, geez, I guess I should know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, big day for us. We should I celebrate it a little bit bigger. <laughs> but I think we get a few mentions on social. <laughs> for sure. Well, I'm so curious. What inspired you to write this book? Good question. So I actually wrote it during the pandemic. So it became my quarantine project. So I had the time and I realized, you know, in my, I'm in a lot of entrepreneur groups and as a business owner, I know what books that everyone is reading, right? Like there's the book about accounting, there's a book about HR, but I never heard, and not that I would need it, but I know for other entrepreneurs, there was never that book on their desk that was for PR. So Mm. I was inspired during quarantine that I had this extra time to write the book and so I spent the, a year and a half writing it all during quarantine. And it was it, it really gave me that time to be able to do something like this, a project like this. So it was just about timing and knowing there was a need for it in the market. So that's the two worlds kind of collided at that. I love that. Why the focus on early stage companies? Is that your passion point as an agency and agency owner? So our clients are more mid-stage, but I did notice there was a need for the early stage for those companies that didn't have the budget for a PR firm just yet to learn more about what PR is, to try a little bit on their own before they can hire the PR firm to do it for them. Mm. And then also for it too, it's good for solo entrepreneurs. It's good for PR students. Anyone who just wants to learn more about the field, it'll be that go-to book on the how to do PR for yourselves or just learn more about it. Do you send this to prospects when they're not ready for you yet? I do. And I even send it to people <laughs> who are interested in working with us in general. It doesn't hurt to be more educated about the industry for the, what the totally. firm you're working with. Totally. So we do. We send it out a lot. I love that. Yeah. Have any of the prospects that weren't ready for you yet become ready and come back after they got uh, the book? Like, scale you know, I don't know. That, like, hey, I'm back. <laughs> I have budget. <laughs> I don't know if they said it was a direct result of the book, but they yeah. did read it. There's a handful of people that did get back to me and they come back with questions sometimes. And they'll say, you know, I read in chapter seven, X, Y, Z. Oh, I you love know, What that. are your thoughts on this? And, it, you know, I love that. And I love the dialogue of it. So even if they're not our client, I just like hearing the feedback. 
I love that. Was there anything that you learned in the process of writing the book that you didn't already know or that surprised you? I think what I learned is that you never say no to a project. So I never thought I would write a book. It's not like something that was on my bucket list. It's not like I grew up thinking I was going to write a book. It kind of just presented itself to me. And so when I saw it and I saw the opportunity, I said, yeah, of course, absolutely. Right. You say yes to everything. That sounds like Mm -hmm. a good idea. And, you know, it sounds overwhelming thinking about the process of it and how to really break it down. But everything is digestible once you start dissecting it and organizing it and making it more manageable. So as soon as I was able to carve out time every single day to write, you know, I think it was like 250 words a day was my goal. And that was it. And by the end of the year, you have a whole book if you do it every single day. So Mm -hmm. when you think of it that way, it's actually much more attainable. So realistically, if you do that with every project that might seem so big and unattainable, you can really get anything done. Has that kind of infiltrated the rest of your work philosophy now that you've, you know, experienced the the output of that? Yeah. Really? Yeah. How how I think so? so. Well, you know, I always... I always said yes to everything. So no project was too big ever, but I think this gave me better perspective on how to structure big projects and organize it better. Hmm. And once you look at it from that way, everything seems a little bit more attainable and accessible Hmm. and less scary. So I think it just, you learn from that and you learn to to carry it with you to other things. I love that. I bet when people hear that you've, you know, authored this book, that it gives you a new boost of credibility too, right? Does it make people look at you different. Yeah, of course. I mean, writing a book isn't an easy thing by any means. So I think that automatically just Mm -hmm. adds the level of credibility, even if they didn't read it yet. Plus there's a lot of cool backing with it, right? Like Inc. Magazine was the publisher for it, their imprint. And then we were on Good Morning America for it. So there's a lot that comes with it too. So there is an added level of credibility Mm -hmm. just by having that project. How did you do that? (laughs) (laughs) you you know you're a good publicist when you're a good publicist for yourself (laughs) I mean apparently that's amazing how did you get it it published by ink well so they have an imprint and so one of my employees actually came across it and they saw it and a lot of our clients like being featured in ink magazine for obvious reasons right like a lot of our clients are business owners entrepreneurs and founders so when I saw the alignment, I said, this is absolutely perfect because if we're pitching new business, we're saying, hey, we're published by Ink Magazine's imprint. It kind of just makes sense and aligns. It adds more credibility. It's so good. Mm-hmm. I love it. Yep. I love it. Yeah. You were also on GMA, you said, or would today's yeah. show or like, where GMA. did you, where? Okay. That's amazing. <laughs> Thank amazing. you. It was really, it was a fun project. It really was. I got to coach um, a small business owner called, the brand is called Tooth Fairy. And we worked together for a few months on this and GMA ported our, our progress together and it turned into so two cool. great segments showcasing what we worked on together from the beginning and then the end and the oh. end results of it all. So it was a really cool progress, an opportunity to show the progress of how PR works with the company. That's so mm-hmm. awesome. Laura, do you have questions? I, I have no, it's just amazed. Okay. And I feel okay. like everybody's writing. Sorry. This is going to keep going, but I'm like, I'm like usurping the whole interview. <laughs> and I feel like everybody's writing books or something. I don't know. It's like going back to, you know, tactile uh, media or something. It's a good opportunity for business owners to do that. So like you guys said, it's another level of credibility. So, you know, a lot of founders are experts, so they might as well document it and then use it as an opportunity to get new business or, mm. you know, increase their brand awareness. So a lot of people are starting to do it. So cool. It just sounds like you were so disciplined about it, which is amazing. I'm, I'm a little blown away, frankly. <laughs> I, I have a lot of discipline. I really do. I get tunnel vision very easily. Someone right. noticed that the other day. They're like, I'm really impressed at how you could do that. Like, you can, And you can't get me out of the tunnel. Once I'm in, it's like I am laser focused and I have, I'm have i on a mission and I need to accomplish it. So, so I cute. do like a tunnel vision really quickly. So cute. I love it. Where do you think PR is going in 2024? Well, I think with the evolution of AI, we're going to see more changes in PR. I don't think we know what that is just yet. Mm -hmm. I don't think it will take away from PR. I think we'll just add to it, but more in terms of efficiencies, right? Because in PR, it's all about relationships and building and 
strategy and that requires the human connection. So it's gonna, it's not gonna replace PR. I think it's just gonna help us be more efficient in our job and mm. be able to create more content for our clients and all of that. But I think in 2024, it's just gonna be more of the adaptation and the modernization of PR. And we look at more tactics and it, you know, it's no longer just the old school traditional methods of just the traditional press ways, right? I think there's gonna be more ways to do all these amazing things mm. and to get more information out more quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see that. Oh, Laura, you're muted, but I see that you're jumping in with a question. How big is your agency? And remind me where you're located. So we're headquartered in Manhattan, but our employees are around the U.S. at this point. So our team works remote, but they're welcome to come into the office at any time. And I'm in and out a few times a week. So I work remote and I'm in the office, but for the most part, our team is remote and across the U.S. Did you do that after the pandemic or was that already like yeah. built in? Okay. No, <laughs> it was definitely. after the pandemic. <laughs> Everyone was in person before that. And then we just, you know, started to realize that the employees, you know, why not give them the perk of working from home that they enjoy it. And if they're doing great work at the same time, I don't care where they work from. So exactly. whatever works for them and whatever allows them to have a good work-life balance. Yeah, totally makes sense to me. Okay, so I have a choose your own adventure two part question. You can do both if you want, but I will not make you do both. So, <laughs> question option one is what do we not ask you yet that we should have? Question option two is what do you want to ask us since we've been asking Ooh. all the questions? Okay, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to turn the table and ask you guys a question. <laughs> so, what inspired you to create a podcast? That's a good one. Laura, do you feel like jumping in? I was podcastless. <laughs> that's it <laughs> I had done a podcast and then I was on a radio show and then I was on another podcast not on the PR industry and then I needed a new podcast and I think April's was like well we should do a podcast and I was it like, was okay. sort of similar to what you were saying about the pandemic it was like uh -huh. slightly pandemic driven but also just sort of it just felt like serendipity because Laura and I both have this sort of unusual performance background and when mm -hmm. we discovered that and that we're both in PR and that we have such a natural chemistry between the two of us it was like, yeah. wait, why aren't we doing a PR podcast? Right. And That's so it, it was like, it just kind of came all at once. And then we brainstormed the name with the full team. And I don't even remember who came up with the PR one down, but it was perfect. But it was like, the idea of the podcast was like, let's make it two girls like gabbing after work. Mm -hmm. over a glass of wine at the bar and having a really candid conversation about the industry and so that's where it came you know although like, we we never actually drink wine you don't you never bring no. out a glass of wine no <laughs> well we always record in the middle of the day so it'll be like one day <laughs> like monday, sure, at two monday. Me. like it's a respectable time for Laura to be drinking but it's like two here so uh, right. oh you're on different coasts so. yeah yeah, makes sense. I'm on the West yeah, Coast. Literally. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, you know, I could pull it off, but five o'clock somewhere. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right. exactly. Yeah, so that's the funny, the funny thing about it. But yes, that's more or less why we started it. Very good, very good. Yeah, it seemed like a fun opportunity to to be able to pull back the curtain on some of the things that happen in the industry that you don't mm -hmm. normally get to hear other people talk about. Mm -hmm. But I think for people listening, the hope was that it would make them feel a little bit normalized, even mm -hmm. if their circumstances are not normal, if that makes yeah. sense. Because I know a yeah, lot of the industry of is a bit crazy. Mm -hmm. So it's just a way of reassuring everybody that they're not crazy. That's the industry. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like a support group. <laughs> it kind of is. Yeah, it kind of is. That was my, like part of the inspiration. Well, right. Sure. We had we had talked about so many crazy stories, and it was like, why aren't we? Right. Like this is right. insane. So but that's where the it, the yeah. horror stories came from. That's why we started <laughs> oh, right, doing the horror, horror stories story segment. Mm -hmm. And that. you have full time employees, so we had people like Veronica who could do the work behind the scenes because it takes a lot. It's a lot. Yeah, yeah. it's a and lot. It's a lot of prepping. April nor I would have the wherewithal to do it so effectively. It's nice when you have the right support staff and everyone works together to get yeah. the get yes. the dream accomplished. Exactly. exactly. And we've won a couple of awards too. That's fantastic. You gotta Congrats. do your own PR, right? Right. There you go. You know. <laughs> awesome. Okay, Jenna, where can people get your book and anything else that you want to plug on your way? And then also yes. where can people find you? 
Yep. So you can get my book, Uni PR, on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Target, wherever books are sold. And then you can follow me on Instagram at Jen Guarneri. And you can follow the company, JMG Public Relations, at JMG underscore PR on Instagram. Or you can go to our website. Thank you so much. It's been so fun and so happy that, you know, this worked out that we got to see you and also that your book is such a success and Thank can't you. wait to hear where it goes from here and your brand new news that you can't share yet. I'm excited. <laughs> Thank you touch. both for having me. This was fun. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you both. All right. Thanks so much, John. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. Well, thank you for tuning in for the PR Wind Down podcast. And thank you to Jenna for joining us for a really great interview. Remember to submit your own agency stories and questions and to share our show with your friends and colleagues. If you subscribe and leave us a rating, it will help us reach new listeners like you. Can't wait to wind down with you again next time. Ba-dum-dum, ba-dum-dum.